Good morning, church. How are you? Great to see you guys. Uh, we're so happy that you can join us here at Park Cities. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well and uh, pray that you would be blessed today as we dive into God's word. Before we do anything, church, I want to pray for us as we get into the scripture and uh, ask that God would just prepare our hearts as we go forward. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we are so grateful that we can be a part of a church that uh, is truly, God, making disciples. And we pray that as we push forward, Lord, with this objective to glorify you through the making of disciples, Lord, I pray that we would not only find success in that, but Lord, that we would find contentment and that we would please your heart through all of that. Lord, as we are diving into the priority of the church today, I pray that there would be a sense of urgency within us so that as we go from this place, we would go knowing what we need to do, knowing that we need to be praying, and that as a church, as a house of prayer, that you desire for the nations to come or to, to be transformed in your light. Thank you, God. Thank you for calling us to this work. We are yours, and we are so grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Well, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we're in the middle of a series entitled The Beginning of a Movement. And while this is more of a description of what the disciples were doing in the early church era, I'm really hoping that this becomes more of a prophecy for our church to describe what will happen here at Park Cities. Amen? That's really my hope and desire. And with that hope, uh, we will march forward. So, in this series so far, we've talked about the purpose, the plan, and the power of the church. And today, we're going to talk about the priority of the church. So through this series, we've talked a lot about the beginnings of the early church with the disciples moving forward uh, post-ascension. And when the book of Acts begins, before ascending, uh, Jesus refers to what he said in Luke chapter 24, which was to wait for the promise of the Father. And the promise, of course, was the Holy Spirit. And, the, and their response, the disciples' response in waiting, was not just sitting down, twiddling their thumbs. Their response was to pray. Chapter 1, verse 14 tells us this. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at the discipleship journey of these apostles and what they went through, I'm not surprised that their first response was prayer and that their devotion was to prayer. I believe that these disciples, they recognized prayer as a key discipline in Jesus' ministry. I mean, you can see the fingerprints of this throughout his ministries, throughout the Gospels, to see just how important prayer was was to Jesus. Well, there was one scene in particular where I saw this as clear as day. And I'm talking about the scene where Jesus overturned the tables in the temple. This, this happened roughly after he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the last week of his life. And he displayed a passionate, maybe even shocking display of his passion for prayer and communion with God. So here's what I mean. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 11. This is where we're going to be camping out today. And we're going to look at verses 15 through 17. So look with me. Mark 11, 15 through 17. This is the word of the Lord. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Amen. Now, we'll break this down a little bit more as we get into our points, but I want to focus in on what Jesus says here in verse 17. 
He said that his house, the place of worship, and, and really in our case, the church, shall be called a house of prayer. You know, it's one thing to say that, our, that prayer is a priority in our church, but, but is it really? And I wanna talk about how we might know for certain that Park City's Baptist Church is truly a house of prayer. I, I essentially have two points for you. I wanna keep it really simple today. And they're essentially describing the two ways that we can be the house of prayer, which is to be collectively a house of prayer and a house of prayer personally. And here's the question that I wanna try and answer today. And that question is, how can we make prayer a priority at Park City's Baptist Church? So, so let's look at how we become a house of prayer collectively. Now, before I go on, I would like to define prayer because I would like for us to see prayer as something we do as a way of life and not just something we do when we bow our heads and clasp our hands and end with, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, in order to do this, I'd like to view prayer in this way. Uh, Dr. David Paulison, he's an author and professor, and he's, he's a scholar on the issue of spiritual disciplines. He says this. Prayer is meant to be the conversation where your life and your God meet. Prayer is meant to be the conversation where your life and your God meet. I I love this because it's so simple, and yet it it also encapsulates really what we're going to be talking about today. So then as we look at prayer in relation to our church as a whole, in light of what I just read to you, if prayer is meant to be the conversation where your life and your God meet, then what kinds of conversations are we having with God when we meet as a church in worship? And what we do here is worship, but I'd also like to see it as a conversation, as a communing with God, as a corporate body interacting with God together. There, there is a, a, a response portion, and I think that's very, very clear. I mean, you, you hear us saying it uh, almost every week, the worship leaders, as we lead from this stage, um, even during host moments and, and even during the end, you might, you might hear some, someone say, well, we're, we're here to respond to God for who he is and what he has done. We're here to respond to God. And so we sit here, we think about the ways that God has been good to us, the, way that, the ways that he has been faithful, and then we simply respond to him. But I would go further and say there's also a component of receiving as well. It's kind of like a conversation. It's not just me talking and talking and talking, but there's also a listening portion as well. We are here to hear from God, to commune with him. So prayer is not just a conversation, but in a larger sense, it is communion with him. I can have conversations with a lot of people throughout the day, uh, some in passing, some mundane, uh, some surface level. Um, some might be very important. Some might be very urgent. But nonetheless, we have, I have conversations throughout the day. But when I find myself communing with someone, when I find myself in, in a life-changing interaction with someone, I remember that interaction for the rest of the week, maybe the rest of the month, maybe the rest of the year. I believe this is how Jesus saw prayer and how the church should be praying on a weekly and daily basis. I'm talking about life-changing interactions that transform us into the people that God is forming us to become. And isn't that what we're here to do? We're here to experience God, to have life-changing transformations as we honor him in worship. You know, Richard Foster, he's a a scholar on the issue of spiritual disciplines, and you might have heard that name before. We've talked about him in previous uh, sermon series. Uh, he, He says this, the primary purpose of prayer is to bring us into such a life of communion with the Father that by the power of the Spirit, we are increasingly conformed to the image of the Son. So if prayer is communion with God and communion with God is meant to conform us to the image of God, how are we doing? In other words, are we leaving this place of worship different than when we came in? 
If we are having a conversation with God collectively as a church body, at the end of that conversation, as we go from this place as a corporate body, how are we doing? You know, never mind the offering figures, never mind the, the attendance numbers. How are we doing in the Department of Transformation? And that's why I love it when, when we can celebrate together things like baptism, you know, things like you know, testimonies of people coming to faith. This is evidence that we're having life-changing conversations as a church, amen? And this is what I long to see on a week-to-week basis. And that is why my prayer each and every week is simply that, is, Lord, I pray that the people who come in to our services on Sundays, that they would not leave here the same way that they came in. And I wanna see transformation in this church, not only with the church, but also with our neighbors, our community, and our nation. You know, throughout the series, we've been talking about the fact that when Jesus told his disciples to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, It was a call for us to disciple and reach those in our immediate spheres of influence, then to those who we may not always interact with, and then to those who look nothing like us. Now, as a church, we can be the house of prayer for all the nations by committing to prayer, interceding for those we see at church, but also those we do not see at church, and then, of course, for our nation as well. So let me ask you, church, who are you praying for today? Who are you praying for these days? And as you enter into this house of prayer, are you leaving this place transformed that you might be a witness, that your life could be a witness to those you are called to disciple? Now, as as a side note, uh, and I'm gonna go off the rails just a little bit, Don't worry, I'll come back. Um, I believe that there are people in this room. I, I I believe that at the 930 service. I believe there are people all across our church. There are some people who I believe are called to be intercessors, that you have a slant, that you have a bent towards just praying for the church, praying for the lost, praying for the nation, for, for people who are truly Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And, and you know, I'm not just talking about Adults, people that maybe you all have been here for many years. I'm also talking to middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, master's students. You guys have a calling to intercede for the church. And if no one has told you that before, let me be the first to tell you. I wanna just plant that seed in you. Some of you may not know that you're called to be intercessors, but if you are, I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to talk to you. And I'd love to see how God has been moving in your heart. Um, Afterwards, I'll be uh, in the connect area, and I'd love to chat with you if you feel like maybe God's calling you to be an intercessor. Don't worry, you're not in trouble. I just I just want to chat with you. I promise. Um, You know, last service nobody came, so I thought, well, I thought maybe I scared some people, but um, but don't worry, you're not in trouble. (laughs) I just want to talk to you. That's all. Um, I'd love to chat with you if you feel that God is calling you to be an intercessor. Let me just plant that seed for you. Now, our church is one with a great history. That's something I've learned in my short time here. I've been here about a year and a half. Um, a great history and also a great legacy. And, and I've been humbled to learn more and more about it the longer that I'm here. And I believe that, I truly believe this. God has honored Park City's Baptist over its long history as a legacy church. And that's a term that I've, I didn't know what that meant, and I keep hearing it over and over, that Park City's Baptist Church is a legacy church. And there's a lot of pride in that, and as as there should be. But I also believe that as a legacy church, that the history of this church, it means nothing without the prayers that have been covering it for years and years and years. And it is my hope after thinking about that, it is my hope that the pride that we have in our distinction of being a legacy church is replaced with our distinction of being a house of prayer, known as a place where people from all over, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, can come to commune with the Father. This is my desire.
And I pray that it is yours as we seek to make prayer a priority in our church. Well, in addition to being a house of prayer as a church collectively, we're called to be a house of prayer personally as well. And I want to shift gears a little bit and get personal as I talk about this. And to do this, I want to point your attention to when Jesus overturned the tables in the temple. You know, it was still understood at this time that the presence of God was within the temple, in the room, the Holy of Holies, in the physical building. But because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, all of that changed, as Paul rightly said to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. He said, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? We are walking temples of God. However... Like the physical temple in Mark 11, there are tables, there are barriers that stand in the way of our communing with God. When we are filled with tables that need to be turned as temples of the living God who make up the church, the work of God can be hindered especially when it comes to the work of God in us. And here, I would ask you, church, that you would take a moment to search your own heart. I hope I'm not being offensive here. I just want you to search your heart and allow the Spirit of God to search your heart here because your prayer life, maybe, maybe you're at a point, and I know I've been here plenty of times, maybe your prayer life is not where you want it to be. Maybe it's because you, maybe you don't feel like you pray enough or maybe you don't pray at the right times or maybe you're just, you just feel cluttered when you pray. What's getting in the way of that? You know, in Luke's account of the story, in chapter 19, verse 45, it says that Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold. You know, and that word for driving out in the Greek, it's the same word used when Jesus was driving out demons. I want you to see that this is actually borderline violent language. But why? I want to quickly remind you that our God is a relational God who died for us so that we can have a right relationship with God the Father. He gave everything so that we can have direct communion with the Father. God's desire for this is powerful. His love for you is fierce. I want us to understand, I want us to understand that spirit. And with that, some of us have some tables that need to be driven out, distractions. Maybe it's a sin. You know, Travis talked about that last week of the conviction of the Holy Spirit of sin. And maybe that's what's hindering your prayer life. Maybe it's a simple distraction like your phone or your TV. I hear about people fasting from media. I get it. I totally understand why that needs to be done. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe that's a distraction that you have, a hindrance. You know, I'll be honest with you, church, There are many times when, despite my desire to be a house of prayer, I can't get myself to pray. I'll even make time to pray. I'll sit down. I'll be still before him, search the scriptures, do everything I know to do to get into the presence of God. But man, it's hard. There are some days when it's just not happening. And I get this feeling that I haven't connected with God. You know, A distinct feeling that I have when I feel this way is my heart and my mind feel cluttered sometimes. I wonder if some of you might feel this way sometimes in your prayer life. I'm there a lot. We are deeply distracted and in desperate need of stillness that would lead us to quality time with the Lord. How about this? We are too busy to pray. We might say that prayer is a priority, but man, our lives are hectic, distracted. This is a real problem for all of us. In fact, 
Richard Foster, uh, again, scholar of spiritual disciplines, he was being interviewed, and his, the question that was asked to him was, what in your mind is the greatest challenge to the North American church today? His answer was distractibility. That was the greatest challenge to the North American church today. I hope that you can build in regular rhythms in your life where either, whether it's through fasting or meditation, that you can discern what tables you have that stand in the way of your direct communion with God. One of the ways that we are hoping that our church would get behind this is we have a rhythm of having a day of prayer and fasting. The first Monday of every month, we're calling our church to prayer and fasting. And tomorrow, tomorrow is the first Monday of the month. Can you believe it's May? My goodness. And so I, I wanna ask that you join us to take some time in your day uh, to pray and fast. It, it might be a meal. Uh, it, might, it might be social media all day. Whatever, however God is calling you to fast, I pray that, that you would discern that sometime today and that tomorrow you devote that day to praying for the church, praying for your neighbors, praying for your disciples, the people that you're investing into, and also let God lead you in that time of prayer. So won't you join us? Also, there's another way we can apply this and, and truly be the house of prayer. Uh, this coming Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. And we're so excited about this, and it really it's an opportunity for our church uh, to be the house of prayer. Um, so essentially, we have a 7 a.m. Uh, Park City Zoom gathering uh, that, that we, we pray that you would, you would log into. 7 a.m., I know it's kind of early for some folks. I get it, but... Uh, but, but it's really a, a, the perfect way to start the day. And so we hope that you will join us. And that'll be Park Cities only. But then 7 p.m., we have a national broadcast that we hope that you tune into. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, throughout the day, I'm, I really hope that you would commit to praying for our nation. Uh, and, and if you don't know how to pray for our country, if, you've, if, you, if, you, if it's not a part of your regular rhythm, um, join us in seven, you know, our 7 a.m. meeting, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see, uh, okay, this is a good rhythm. This is a good way of praying for our church. And hopefully you'll be equipped that way. That way you can make it a part of your, your rhythm regularly. And so join us, National Day of Prayer, 7 a.m., Park City's uh, Zoom gathering. I believe it's on our website. You'll be able to see all the links. And if you have any questions, of course, you can always ask me. But, uh, but we really hope that you'll join us this whole week uh, as we commit ourselves to prayer. You know, recently I was appointed the staff liaison to the, to the prayer committee for our church. And I remember attending my first prayer committee meeting and distinctly thinking, wow, I'm in the presence of the prayer warriors at our church. And, and needless to say, I was humbled and, and gracious that these men and women, some of them who've been a part of this ministry for years, have been praying for the church faithfully and, and without a lot of fanfare. And in this meeting, something I heard was that it was the prayer committee's desire to see the church pray more, to pray more. So while this team has been praying for you and our church, our desire is that you would join us in prayer, to be the house of prayer, that this place could be a house of prayer. You see, becoming a house of prayer requires that those in the house are praying. And even more, that those in the house of prayer treat it as a priority, which leads me to really the main idea of this message, which is essentially the answer to the initial question that I posed in the beginning, which was how can we make prayer a priority here at Park Cities Baptist Church? And so the idea is this, is that prayer becomes a priority collectively when we become houses of prayer personally. So church, right, this house, this house will be a house of prayer. I want this to be our declaration today. I want this to be our commitment today 
as we commit that to a priority. As we continue to make prayer a priority in your relationship with Jesus, know that as those who make up the church, Park City's Baptist becomes a house of prayer for the nations. Now, isn't that what happened with the apostles in Acts? Right? Chapter 1, verse 14 tells us that as they waited on the Holy Spirit, they devoted themselves to what? To prayer. Prayer was a priority, and because of this, the disciples were able to launch a movement through the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. It created houses of prayers throughout the world, and I'm not just talking about the church, the churches that were planted, but also transformed lives that served as places to commune with God. So church, let's become houses of prayer personally, so that we collectively can be a house of prayer for the nations. Now, before I close, uh, I wanna pray for us. Um, and then afterwards, I wanna invite Megan to come back up and lead us in a time of communion, which is really just the way I see it. Again, continuing the conversation that we have with God, the communion that we have with God. And so let's prepare our hearts for that and let's pray. God, we thank you for this call to make this a priority in our church. God, we desire to be the house of prayer for the nations. But Lord, that begins with us, and oftentimes that's how revival works, Lord. Revival starts with individuals. Revivals start with smaller groups, and they they expand. Lord, we want to be the catalyst. Lord, we want to be the house of prayer for the nations. Use us, God as we make prayer a priority here at Park City's Baptist Church and also in our lives. God, thank you for this word. Walk with us as we make that a reality, as we go from this place, that we would leave transformed and that we would leave with the priority of prayer in our hearts. Thank you, thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.